to say first um, one quick word about the, uh, this lecture series that uh, we hold every um, other year or so, and then introduce our speaker for tonight. No? The um, McGivney lecture series are titled after Father McGivney, who, as many of you know, is the founder of the Knights of Columbus in uh, 1882. That is a fraternal benefit society aimed at protecting the widows and children of working men and foster their faith and their social progress. Right? So in honor of Father McGivney, the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies of Marriage and Family periodically invites distinguished Catholic scholars to lecture in the fields of theology, philosophy, and other disciplines. Lectures have included John Finnis, Elizabeth Anscombe, Ralph McInerney, <laughs> Kenneth Schmidt, Benedict Ashley, Jerome Lejeune, Christoph Cardinal Schoenborn, Mark Cardinal Wallet, Luis Alonso Schoeckel, Francis Martin, Marco Rupnik, and uh, the last one we had two years ago, uh, Robert Speyman. Now this, uh, this week we have the honor to host um, Professor Stanislaw Grigel, who is a familiar face to many of us because he uh, always comes on uh, during the week of master's class in January just to teach our master's uh, students. Professor Griegel is Professor Emeritus of Philosophical Anthropology at the Pontifical John Paul II Institute here in Rome. He earned his doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of Lublin under the direction of Karol Wojtyła with a dissertation on the ethics of Jean Paul Sartre. Professor Griegel has also taught at the Academy of Theology in Lugano the Pontifical Academy of the Holy Cross, and the Pontifical Academy of Theology in Krakow. He is co-founder and the editor of the journal Il Nuovo Areopago. He is a member of the editorial board of the French edition of Communio, International Catholic Review, and served for many years as the editor of the Catholic journal Znak. Right. Pronounced correctly, I hope. There you go. <laughs> Professor Giegel is a member of the Polish Philosophical Society, the Philosophical Society of Argentina, and the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Today's lecture is titled uh, The Origins of an Adequate Anthropology. And uh, the goal of all these three lectures, as the title of uh, them indicates, is uh, to help discovering the human person with um, Blessed John Paul II. Please uh, help me in welcoming Professor Griegel. Thank you very much for your words, kind words, maybe too kind <laughs> words. <laughs> and uh, excuse me, my voice, but always when I am in the United States in March, I am like today, this. <laughs> so excuse me this. Bowing me before all of you here, I tell you cordially good evening. And I invite you to med co meditate with me about the person of John Paul II's person and about the origins of his adequate anthropology. Who was Blessed John Paul II. Only God knows the answer to this <laughs> question. None of us fully knows his own nature. Speaking more precisely, none of us fully knows the reality indicate, indicated by our names. Person is not concept that signifies something. It is the name that indicates an event which we cannot adequately know. We must look and wait 
for it, for this person, for my person. The person of each of us is to be revealed. We see only the traces of our own person. We see our own person, if I can say so, only from behind. Therefore, for me, so many years ago, I proposed to create a negative anthropology, but not, not, not only negative theology. The person's name, name points to the home and the traditions that form the love to which we belong. At the same time, a name points to the future, that the person must build together with others so that he can live there with them. For this reason, to the question, who was John Paul II, I will respond without hesitation. He was a person who knew how to work and how to be a home for human beings. He knew how to wait for the revelation of his person, in, especially in the others. And he knew how to follow the traces his person had left behind him. The human person receives his name from those who love him and whom he loves. The name comes from the gaze of a person at a person. When we gaze at the other person, something primordial is revealed to us. This gaze of a person at a person is a source of moral obligations. In Greek, gaze means theos. At the root, moral obligations are not at all to be conflated with the habits that govern society at the present moment. Such obligations are rather identical with the call with which love calls the lo to love. It is the beautiful, the form of love, that calls man to work. The beautiful re reawakens amazement and wonder in us. It fills us. It fills us with eagerness for life in this world according to a logic that is not of this world. It prompts us to transform our own life into a great poetical work, poiein. In doing this, the human person penetrates the meaning of his existence in, on these earths. He becomes a friend of wisdom. A philosophos. The light of the beautiful allows him to look on the world and himself in a rational way. The light of the beautiful renders us logical. In 1977, at the Catholic University of Milan, Cardinal Karol Wojtyla gave a conference that dealt with the sources of his vision of human life and culture. One of these sources emerges in a poem of the Polish poet Cyprian Kamil Norwid from Etidion. I think that I can say, that I think I can say that in this work, Karol Wojtyla found a confirmation of his adequate anthropology. Norwid writes, beauty is a form of love. Beauty is to make you eager to work. And work is for, ma for a man to gain, a, uh, to gain a resurrection. This is the culture of the truth of man. With whom did John Paul II build a home? What tradition of work did he help to increase as he transmitted it to others? The answer to these questions point to some extent to who he was. Once, in the first years of Pope John Paul II's pontificate, I had the courage to tell him that he was very alone in the church. 
you are criticized not only by theologians, but also by priests and even bishops, Holy Father. I said to him, they don't understand you. After reflecting for a while, he answered, I am not alone. The laity are with me. The laymen are with me. Reflect on this. In John Paul, in John Paul II's consciousness, a priestly life shared with lay people confirmed the evangelical truths of Norwich's words. Man, he is a high priest, unaware and still immature. Wonderful. On March 8, 1964, as he was installed as Archbishop of Krakow in Wawel, in Wawel Cathedral, he said, I said, I think that to be a pastor means to know how to receive everything that others contribute and the burdens that others carry. It is to know how to coordinate, to put together, so that out of all this, the good that is common to all can grow. Each of us is a great treasure. End of citation. As Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyła continued to open the doors of his house to all people at all times, even at night, if necessary. One could enter directly from the street he was not afraid to receive people even, even when meeting them could pose a great risk to himself. In the 70s, it seems to me 72, 3, I twice accompanied a Russian professor of the Soviet Academy of Sciences to the Archbishop residence in the night. Because you will see why. He feared this man, Russian man, to be followed by the agents. The man's, this professor's father, had been a general and hero, hero of the Soviet Union, who had worked closely with the notorious, terrible Laurenti Beria, Marshal of the Soviet Union and Chief of the Minister of the State Security, NKVD or the secret police. You know, he was almost number two after Beria, and who knows who was Beria, can imagine the risky we have accepted to do these meetings twice in the night. This dangerous conversation bore much fruit for the universal church. He told the Archbishop many things about Russia and about the church in Russia. And the second, during the second encounter, Archbishop thanked him in the name of Holy See. They ended these uh, meetings, they ended with a blessing imparted by Cardinal Wojtyla to the kneeling Russian whose baptism had been kept secret even from his mother. His father was already dead now. The mother, friend of Brezhnev, Kosygin, Beria, Stalin, when he realized that his, her son was already baptized in clandestine way, way had an uh, infarctus, uh, heart attack, heart attack. I brought to the cardinal by night two Russian women of Jewish origin, professors of, at the University of Moscow, who subsequently were baptized in Warsaw. The courage of Karol Wojtyla had its source in his complete entrustment of himself to the truths and its consequences. The first layman to form Wojtyla's relation with God was his father. Through prayer, 
his father's love, which, also, which was also full of maternal care for the boy who had lost his mother, opened the child's filial love to the love that united the father with the son in the Holy Trinity. Great things must have been awakened in the young Vaitiwa as he listened attentively to the words of the tailor Jan Teranowski and perceived the fire in them. This tailor was living on the outskirts of Krakow, educated, who, who lived on the outskirts of Krakow, educated young men without having the faintest idea of education. He simply gave them what he himself became while seeking God, nothing more. When the, Nazi lie, when the Nazi lie raged over Europe with calculated precision, and the Russian lash, lash had already begun to strike Poland, in the young man who listened to him, Turanowski laid the mystical foundation, foundations of the House of Freedom. With the help of great mystic, mystics, such as St. John, of the cross and Saint Louis Grignon de Montfort. He taught them to win their freedom through a daily labor that did not mark the price. By being present to him, Jan Teranowski showed Vaitua what it means to be present to man. Karol Vaitua profited from his dialogue of gifts that took place in the tailor's tiny room as a priest, a bishop, and finally as pope. <coughs> How to be present to the others. From Father Wojtyła's experience as pastor of the students and professors at Krakow, of Krakow, the group was, the group was born that called itself środowisko, or roughly translated milieu. Many of these young people who prayed together and shared vacations with him matured in a holiness. We have already one servant of God of this milieu. Preparing these young people for marriage, Wojtyła, the priest, learned to, the, to love human love. He learned to understand better the sacramental mystery of marriage to which he had not been called. God has closed him this door in a special way, but in which he participated through the conjugal love of the persons entrusted to him. This is the genesis of the book Love and responsibility, responsibility. The group of actors that formed around the person of Mieczysław Kowatlarczyk, the founder of the Rhapsody Theater, provided an analogous environment. In this form of dream, the word itself played the fundamental role. The beautiful word reveals the ethical and moral force of human love that is tied to the truths. In this theater, Wojtyła learned how to transmit the word, its material and its content to others. A man, a man must be present in the word he speaks to others. Otherwise, the words are empty. This experience of Shodovisko and of the Rhapsodic Theater revealed to Wojtyła that building up the House of Freedom cannot be a solitary enterprise. Freedom is always a freedom of the communion of persons. For this reason, every form of totalitarianism will always wage war against interpersonal relations. Therefore, where marriage and the family are affronted, 
intact, then without a doubt, we are dealing with a totalitarian system of one kind or another. At the threshold of family homes, totalitarian systems lose their power. They are overcome by mysticism of love. <coughs> the human person becomes morally upright in friendships, in marriage, in the family, in the nation, that is, in ecclesia, in the Greek sense or in ecclesia, in the church. In these personal communions, people confess themselves to one another. So you should not be surprised if in times when freedom is despised, the secret police surround with particular care, between quotation marks, care, those who dare to enter the tradition of courageous and laborious being together with others, a reciprocal entrustment, a faith in the fruits of shared search for the truth in love. The totalitarian system systems try to destroy the marriage and the family. So be careful, even here. Not only in the Europe. The priest, Father Karl Vetua, was one of the strongest links of this tradition of interpersonal relations. Therefore, he was so between quotation marks well followed by the agents. That, uh, you know, it is not to smile; it is rather to sweep, uh, to, to weep. <laughs> now, recording this, reminding this, you know, it is very interesting. But to leave this. Mm, The tradition of courageous love, that is the tradition of responding with love to the love that created us, give rise in Vaitua to an anthropology that was adequate to the divine human truths which calls us to journey toward it. Toward it. Karl Vaitua perceived this divine human truth in the human person moral experience. Within the tradition of the laborious being together with others, he matured in the tradition of the laborious being together with God. With the others, tradition, and the tradition with God. Always laborious, working and loving. <coughs> in God, together with others, he built up the communio personarum. The word, word communio is derived from the words munus, Latin words munus, task, and cum, wits. Cum munere, wits, a task, means to live with a task. Your person is therefore my task. Cum munere, and that is communio personarum. Every person is a task, a munus, for other persons. Each person bears personal obligations, munia sustinet, munia da munus, personal obligations. These obligations defend freedom by binding human love to the truths to which it belongs. The person is tasked with it, is he, she is his munita. Munita, so defended by the walls, like fortress, Munita. The person must give thanks to the other persons for this fortification. You defend me, and I defend you. This is the content of the word solidarność, solidarity. Wojtyła, uh, focused uh, his attention on this category in person and act, uh, acting person, it seems to me, in acting person, 10 years before the Polish solidarity movement saw the light of day. 
John Paul II's pastoral work consisted in a shared laborious seeking with others, seeking that reality to which we all belong. He cited sometimes Norvid, I will say of work that it is seeking what we lost. Hence, the song, a continual recalling to seek what we have lost. That is a work, working, it means working. <coughs> the pastoral work of the priest Karol Wojtyła had the character of poetry, of poetry, love, calling. It did not fall into the routine that entraps those who produce pastoral objects, almost as if to profit by them. We cannot approach a person with our own industry. We journey toward him, being called by him, and calling him, following the traces he has left behind in words that are acts and acts that are words. God leaves similar traces in his creature, Vestigia Dei, St. Augustine. In following them, we call the person and await his response. When a person passes by, having, having drawn near to us, the beauty that remains in us as a trace reawakens wonder in us. We can do justice to this beauty only through reflection and contemplative silence. This is how we do justice to man and to God, who, I cite, is here. This uh, the words. We do justice to man and to God, who is there, only a tremor here, only words retrieved from nothingness. Oh. And a particle still remains of that amazement which will become the essence of eternity. You know, this trembling provoked by the beauty, by the other persons, maybe will remain in us. Maybe it is already the content of eternity. As Vaitua says, this is the love without which man cannot live. Love, I cite him, love explained all for me. All was resolved by love. So this love I adore, wherever it may be. Because of these words, you know, for Vitua, it was clear that the man, man, uh, male, can address himself to the woman, beloved woman, <coughs> like he addresses himself to God. My darling, I adore you. Wherever it may be, a crumb, crumbs of beauty, divine beauty, I adore you. We are at likeness of God, then we can be adored by the others. The silence that expresses his love is prayer. With this word, Vaitiva drew near not only to God, but also to man with prayer. Prayer gave form to his life and to his person from the first years of his youth. Every time I enter at John Paul II's private chapel in the Vatican for Holy Mass, the first thing that struck me was a white rock of prayer leaning there on the prie-dieu. Every time, Bishop Vaitua and I found ourselves in a car together, every time when we found <coughs> ourselves, prayer framed our conversation during the walks, uh, our conversation were only suspensions of silence, crumbs of his prayer. 
Prayer framed our conversation during the walks we took outside the city to avoid the police eavesdropping via wiretaps. We spoke and we prayed. And sometimes we ate. Conversation with God was for him a school for conversation with human beings. When he spoke with someone, he looked at the other person and listened to him attentively, as if he, as even trusting himself to the other's words. He listened more than he spoke. There was no reproach in his eyes. Sometimes there was only sorrow, because, as he said, we don't understand each other. One day, after having listened to a fairly well-known Italian priest give an aggressive reply in defense of his own actions, John Paul II simply said, I see, Monsignor, that now nothing, nothing is left to me but to go into the chapel and pray. He did not uh, he did not polemics. No. If only God knows what is a man, what is in man, then only in prayer can the truths of man be known. The pastor who prays little or not at all is not a pastor. If he does not speak to God, he will not know how to speak to human beings to help them to know themselves and God. The mystery of dazzlingly is dazzlingly bright. It is impossible to gaze direct, directly at it. We can merely look upon the visible world rationally in its invisible light. The human person is a mystery like the mystery of God. We do us adequate anthropology is indebted to the light of both those, these mysteries. The light of the word act of the living God revealed to Karl Wojtyla the truths about man, as indicated by the word, word acts of his person. At the same time, the light that radiates from the word acts of the human person allowed him to enter more deeply into the word act that God addresses to man. Jesus, God act, uh, word act. <coughs> Karl Vitiva came to know, to know man by praying to God, and he came to know God by dialoguing with man in the attitude of prayer. Anyone who tries to know God and man in any other way will know only his own thoughts. <coughs> The pa this patience and silence revealed the greatness of the hope that Karol Wojtyla placed in God. Once he showed me a letter in which a well-known European theologian asked him to modify the church's con conjugal ethics. The theologian argued for his own position by citing the fact that people had abandoned it and were continuing to abandon the church because of the Pope's inflexible teaching. <coughs> he asked me, what do you think about this letter? From behind clenched, clenched teeth, as Homer says, the words escaped me. But this is stupid, Holy Father. <laughs> and I continued. He forgot, he forgot that Christ was already in a situation like this centuries ago and asked the 12 who remained with him, do you also wish to go away? Go. After a moment of silence, the Pope said simply, yes, that is true, but who will tell him this? And he withdrew to his chapel to pray. John Paul II listened attentively to the human person first word, which is his body oriented to the other person. The interior life of the human person 
expresses itself first of all in the body. It expresses itself in the unity of man and woman. Together with the faithful John Paul II, listen it with the faithful man. <coughs> John Paul II listened to this word that is the body. He listened to the body. In a reflection full of wonder, he contemplated its beauty, which united man and woman in one flesh. Those who do not contemplate the one flesh of man and woman think of them as they think of the abstract product, products of reason. They do not entrust themselves to its beauty because they do not know to love it. Therefore, they turn their own body into the object of their manipulations. It is their sarcophobia or fear of the body that devastates contemporary society. I t at the first, I, I, I wanted to say homophobia, but afterwards, no, I, I have chosen sarcophobia. Sarks, yes. flesh. Man is like a tree. He grows from earth cultivated in, by those who have already disappeared and enters into their work. He is rooted in the past and in the future. That is, in the love that creates and saves man. Past creates, saves future. With hope, he responds to the voice of the promise that reaches him from beyond history. Similarly, the future is today, only a little farther ahead of us. In the past and in the future, we find the house of our fathers, we find our country, homeland. It was the, the three great bishops of Krakow, along with two great religious who influenced Karol Wojtyła's priestly and episcopal service. Their spiritual presence helped him to give a beautiful form to his life and work. They taught him how to be prudently courageous so that his service could help people in their work to gain their resurrection. The first of these was the martyr Bishop St. Stanislaw, in whom Polish bishop, bishops find the model for their pastoral work. He carelessly, ceaselessly, Remind them that they bear responsibility for the people and that they must oppose themselves to every authority that injures these people. Saint Stanislav lived from 1030 to circa about 1079 and became Bishop of Krakow in uh, 1072. In uh, 79, when he did not hesitate to tell King Boleslas the bold, you may not behave in this way, and excommunicated him, the king had him murdered before the altar. Cardinal Wojtyła dedicated his penultimate poem, Stanislas, written in 78, to his holy predecessor. The direct predecessor of Metropolitan Archbishop Wojtyła in the Episcopal seat of Krakow was Cardinal Prince Adam Sapiecha, dead in 1951, who became bishop in Krakow in 1911. Sapiecha, called the unbreakable prince, was national hero, protector of the poor, and defender of the persecuted and the victims of the oppressive regimes. Nazi and communism. Risking prison and his own life, he cried out to the German occupiers and then to the communist authorities, you may not behave in this way. Both the Nazis and the communists respected him. They were downright afraid of him. The communists began a trial to convict him only after his death. I was confirmed by this cardinal. 
So it is my, I am very, very proud of this. Bishop Wojtyła entered the Cathedral of Krakow to be installed as a Metropolitan Archbishop with a certain reverent fear. I sighed, when today I found myself before the tomb of San Stanislaw, I realized that in front of this altar lies my, I am afraid to say it, my predecessor. I am afraid to say it, to say it because everyone in Poland knows what this name means, Adam Stefan Cardinal Sapieha. Wojtyła could not stop marveling that he was Sapieha's successor. Astonished at the nomination, he confided to Monsignor Stanislaw Czartoryski, <coughs> and he confided to me, I, successor of to Cardinal, Wojty uh, to Cardinal Sapieha, he could not believe in it. From him, John Paul II learned that when man entrusts himself to the consequences of the truth, he became, becomes unbreakable. The nation is unbreakable that has people who wait with courage for the victory of truth. The truth does not need to be defended. Truths can never be refuted, says Socrates to Polos. Those who do not resist with it are already conquered. I cite Vaitiva, weak is the people that accept defeat, forgetting that it was sent to keep watch till the coming of, of his hour. And the hours keep returning on the great clock face of history. End of station. The coincidence of the facts seems more and more important to me, of two facts, more in, uh, important to me. The pact entered into by Primate Stefan Wyszyński and Polish bishops, which introduced the modus vivendi between the Catholic Church in Poland and the communist government in uh, 50, does not bear the signature of Cardinal Sapieha. He did not accept this modus vivendi. He refused it. One of the articles of this pact obliged ordinaries to promise loyalty with respect to the government, ordinary bishops. During a conversation, John Paul II said to me, you know, Stanislav, I am the, as, as Pope, he said it to me, you know, I am the only bishop that did not make this promise of loyalty. How did that happen, I asked. I don't know, he replied. I simply did not go to their office and they did not insist. <laughs> you know, for me it is a sign that he was already prepared for Peter's seat. After Saint Stanislaw and Cardinal Wojciechowski, the third bishop who influenced the form of Karol Wojtyła's pastoral service was a servant of God, Bishop Jan Pietraszko, who benedicted our marriage. Pietraszko was the older of the two by a few years, but Wojtyła cho chose, chose him as his own auxiliary bishop. Bishop Pietraszko opened to Wojtyła the path to youths, as John Paul II himself testified in a telegram to Krakow on the occasion of Pietraszko's death. My wife and I were witnesses when, one evening, Pope John, uh, Paul, John Paul II said to him, to Bishop Pietraszko, Bishop Jan, John, Bishop Jan, I learned theology from you. Bishop Jan Pietraszko told me of his first meeting with Karol Wojtyła. It took place during the war in the apartment of Archbishop Sapieha whose secretary Pietraszko was at, that, at the time. One evening, the archbishop told him that the following morning, a young student, a worker, would come to serve mass. Father, give him a good breakfast. He needs it. He has a great future before him. Take care of him. The words of Sapieha to, Piet to, bishop, to secretary Pietraszko. The next day, early in the morning, a, th a thin young man arrived holding a armful of books tied together with string. It was Karol Wojtyła. John Paul II once said to me that when he addressed priests or lay people in the presence of Bishop Jan Pietraszko, 
He watched the latter's face constantly. If he, I sighed, if he wrinkled his brow or gave me a look, these were signs to me that I had said something I should not have said. <laughs> As university chaplains, they taught us to look at life in the light of the Bible and to read the Bible in the light of daily life. This allowed us to judge not only our lives, but the political situation from which, humanly speaking, we saw no escape. Without entering into active political opposition, they taught us to engage in true politics in the deepest meaning of the term. But they did not need methods learned from a pastoral handbook. Their pastoral work consisted simply in their presence before God in everything they thought and did. Present to God, they were also present to the people in church, in their homes, and in the streets. A final great influence on the formation of John Paul II's person were two insurgents of the general uprising on 1863 in Poland. These men fought against the Russians for the freedom of Poland, which three invaders, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, erased from the political map of Europe for almost 150 years. From such patriots, Wojtyła learned the love that defends man when he is threatened in his being, by the aggressor as well as by material and cultural poverty. It was granted to him to elevate both of them to the honors of the altars, as St. Albert Chmielowski, painter and founder of a religious order in Krakow that cared for the poor and abandoned, <coughs> and St. Raphael Kalinowski, a Carmelite priest, both insurgent, and both have lost one leg uh, in the time during the, uh, 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 no, during the insurgency. Fighting. What did I receive from blessed John Paul II? This is a difficult question for me to answer. He directed my doctoral thesis, but he was not an academic uh, professor to me. He did not hold the erudition to be very important. Instead, he was interested in a student's thought. The thought that arose from the person's experience and that strove to encompass and express it. Our conversation contained more silence than words more indicating the invisible than defining the things we can see and grasp. Rilke affirms that only the saints know how to listen to invisible voices. Wojtyła knew how to listen to them. In his presence, I sense it that man is only comprehensibly from there, not from here. Professor Wojtyła was an autodidact. Perhaps for this reason, he did not hinder us, his students, from seeking the truth with our own strength. He did not demand erudition. Rather, he simply led us to the source. Kneeling together with us there, he contemplated the pure water that flowed from it. With it, he quenched our thirst. Karol Wojtyła inspired in his students an atmosphere of the happiness. The happiness without which one cannot think logically. The gift of happiness comes to us through the moral conscience. It comes as the fruit of acts in which the person fulfills himself in the love of truth. It means in the love of eternal future. The future is so transcendent with a respect to human acts and thought that it causes him pain. Wojtyła knew existentially what Norwid wrote. Eternal, I cite Norwid, eternal future on the field that is not eternal. Laughing at weak men, you place him before a single end, sorrow, and a single truth, that he awaits it. From his early years, an awareness of death never left Wojtyła. His experience of time spoke to him of passing. 
Canon Voitua's meditation of death helped me to live more religiously and thus more metaphysically. I remember one December evening in uh, 74, the Cardinal and I were walking through Caracu along, uh, along snow-covered uh, streets, exchanging thoughts on this poem, which had not yet been published. It was in manuscript. We stayed in the park we had entered so as to be alone, conversing until midnight. We spoke with words, filled with silence, more than with concepts. We talked for a long time of the annihilation that one had to pass through in order to be able to be reborn and to be. Thanks to the presence of great people in his life, his experience spoke to him still more of becoming the one about whom man, the seeker, ask, asks questions. I will only record, if you permit, this evening we were so emerged in the reflection that we have lost the sense of time. And when we tried to go out from park, we realized that the door of park was already closed. So I was a little snow, you know, winter, midnight. I was a little perplexed because of my wife. She knew where and with whom I was, but many things could happen in those times. And they were not cellulars. <laughs> so, Louis, uh, the sink uh, my perplexions, put his hand on my hand and said to me, Stanislav, don't be afraid. I know the hole in the hedge. <laughs> <laughs> and really, he knew it, that there was a hole. <laughs> so for me, it is a symbol how to find such hole in the moment of our deaths, you know. It was precisely Voitua's moral experience of man that formed anthropocentrism, making it theocentric. The moral experience of the human person presupposes the metaphysical memory of the love that begins to reveal itself precisely in this experience. I don't know what to do. Five minutes. So I must abbreviate. <laughs> Professor Wojtyla taught us to accept criticism in such a way that we could reverence more profoundly the truths we are asking about and seeking. One day, he sent me a letter he had received from a Catholic writer who, while prizing one of my articles for its creativity in reflection, revealed that it concealed within it the possibility of a heresy. <laughs> I note in passing that the same article drew the atten attention of the professor from Moscow, uh, this of, uh, son of general, uh, <coughs> to me. And he sought me because of this article. After I had read the letter, I asked the cardinal, what should I do? The res response was brief, nothing. It is enough to know it and keep working. Remembering this experience, I gave him a similar response when he was already pope. When I conveyed to him information provided by a very credible source to the effect that communist secret agents had had great success in penetrating his entourage, close entourage in the Vatican, uh, it was in the 80s, he asked me, I thought so. So what do I do? I said just as briefly, nothing. It is enough to know it and be cautious. God will take care of the rest. <laughs> and it, it was so. Ha. Sanctity, and maybe I will finish with this. Sanctity reaches man in acts accomplished at the crossroads of eternity and the ephemeral. On the crossroads. It reaches him from 
beyond, beyond history. That is, from beyond this world, sanctity. With such sanctity, the true and the good come into the wor into world and change it. Sanctities change the world. We do not change the world changing the structures. It is production, not culture. No. Praxis that precedes the sanctity alienates man and destroys his environment. For it makes the true and the good depend on him. John Paul II thought and existed so heroically in the history of his earth's life that he was free. So free that when he was asked what single sentence from the Bible he would save if all the rest of the scripture were to be destroyed, he responded without hesitation. This one, you will know the truths and the truths will set you free. He thought and lived it heroically in history because he sought his source, his own source. Okay. That maybe this curiosity. I was convicted, convinced, not convicted, convinced. <laughs> I was convinced that he was aware of being prepared to, the, to being the Peter. You know, after his return from the conclave that had elected Alberto, uh, 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 no, Alberto Luciani as John Paul I, I said to Cardinal Wojtyla, I was afraid that you would not come back to Krakow. Why, he asked, because there would not be anyone for us to lean on in this difficult time. Upon reflecting for a moment, he replied, of course, you would find someone you could lean on. After I heard these words, it was clear to me that he had been seriously considered as a candidate at the conclave. John Paul I's secretary told me that after the conclave, the Pope uh, Luciani confided the person in his entourage. The cardinals did me an injury because the new Pope should have been someone else, but unfortunately, he is not Italian. A few days later, this secretary asked John Paul I who that other cardinal might be. Answer, he was sitting in front of me at the conclave. Many years later, when the same, that same Monsignor had access to the official documents of the conclave, he could verify that in front of Cardinal Luciani said Cardinal Vaitewa. And the last thought, <laughs> Cardinal, Vo Cardinal Vojtyla was a poor man. And therefore, he was so free. He was powerfully free. <laughs> He could not be blackmailed. Nothing. He had only one, uh, no, pantalons. Trousers. Trousers, yeah. Only one pair of trousers with the holes. <laughs> no. One pair of shoes and nothing more. Even his stipend he divided among his students. He was poor, but he did not show it. He was really senior. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Giegel. It's been a very uh, rich talk with many uh, suggestive insights. We have a few a few minutes now if, uh, for, uh, for questions. And there will be also a reception afterwards. So if uh, we can't take all your questions, there probably will be 
opportunity to catch up with him afterwards. Yes. Excuse me, I will answer you with my perso personal experience. When, I'm, when I am alone and there is nobody I can, uh, with whom I can be together, with uh, whom I can speak, laugh, eat, be silent. I am homeless. It is a solitude. It is a misery. I have no home in this sense. In marriage, you know, my home is my wife. And I hope that her home is my, per my person. We can be together. We live one, each one in the another. She, me, and me, in her. Me. When we live so, when we so are communere, communio personarum, it is home, communio personarum, communere, the task. I am stronger. I am more free. I remember that when I was summoned to the secret police for some interrogations or taken from street, I trembled. My stomach was full of pains. But the thought that there is my wife, I am not alone. There is Cardinal, there is the Bishop Pietraszko, I am not alone. Immediately, I feel that I was, I felt that I was stronger. I did not dare to say it. Unbreakably, you know. Because, not of me, but because of them, of their presence to me. And that, that is, the communists were very intelligent when they tried to destroy these relations. Because they knew that the homeless are manipulable. They can be manipulated, the homeless, you know. If someone is loved, he is too strong for the totalitarian systems. He, ha she has no home, you know. This. Home is a shelter, is a shelter. When it rains, you enter in the shelter. So one person for another person is the shelter. And it is in the shelters that we feel stronger and our easy, easier, easy, stronger and more free, more free. I think that God is strong because there are three persons in him. If he were only one person, <coughs> he would not be person then, he would not be person. If he would be only one, not person, he would be very, very weak. We could manipulate him. It is the absolute, absolute. The absolute, Aristotle's absolute, who does not know us, does not love us, but we love him, but he does not know it, you know, is manipulated by us. From this absolute of Aristotle is born the deism in the illumination. And from deism, 
we have created the atheism. That is our manipulation. Why? Because absolute is not true. It's not trinity. I don't know whether it is sufficient. What do you ask me? In this afternoon, my wife went to the church for Holy Mass, and I remained with the son, young, five years, five years, five years, uh, and waited the news through the radio, not Polish, but foreigner. And when we have heard Habemus Papam Eminentissimum Matria Cardinalem Vaitua, my son jumped, <laughs> took the pen, and uh, one sheet like this, and wrote the letter. Dear Holy Father, They have elected you Pope, <laughs> notwithstanding, or not, notwithstanding that I have loved you so much. <laughs> so it is against my love. <laughs> and firm, and firm signature. This, uh, this letter we have sent, <coughs> expressed and so on, and uh, one told me then, then in the Vatican radio they have read this. <laughs> <coughs> against myself. <laughs> so it is it. But we were very, very, very happy. All overnight, there were manifestations. You can imagine manifestation without permission, but the police did not know what to do. Because in every church, masses, 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 all, all bells. So uh, the people in the streets sang, cried. No, it was already the end of communism. It was already the end of communism. Till, till the, uh, till the uh, morning. And uh, the day after, the people asked the possibility to have the passport because we, we had not passport to have passports to organize some uh, trip to Vatican. And they were, the authorities, communists were so confused that they do, did not know what to do. And uh, they were forced by the people to organize some trips uh, by airplanes, you know. We were both, my wife and me, were there. And I can say, the auxiliary bishop Pietraszko, I mentioned him, you know, who f feared to fly. And there was a 10th ten an ten anniversary of our marriage. So he had two tickets and he gave us as a gift for our 10th anniversary ma marriage, marriage. So we could be there. You know. And uh, but that is all. We were only aware, sure, that sooner or later we will be free. The nation, the nation, the state, and so on. We don't know what, when, but because before the election, we thought that maybe during our life, no, it was impossible. <laughs> so he abbreviated this waiting. <laughs> Maybe one, one last question. What, um, what was the idea of uh, how, how did a, the lay person uh, uh, witness this uh, adequate uh, anthropology in politics for John Paul II? And in particular, uh, what was his relation with Pope Yusko, the priest Pope Yusko? Si, Pope Yusko. But no, we have no contact with him. Huh? We have no contact with him. No, with you, didn't have any contact? No, 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 no. It was uh, in the 80s 
whereas uh, our group was in 50, 60, 70, so the before, before. You know, how we entered in the politics, without doing politics, It was this, this way only, to be entrusted in it. To the truth, to its consequences. So not to lie. When, for example, when the secret police asked us, me for example, something, and I could not tell it, but I did not want to lie. So we gave the answers with some lie by. And they didn't know anything from this, what we have said. You know, nothing. So we ought to be clever wise, clever, and, and simple in response. God is God. I am Catholic. I believe in God. I am not Marxist. I am not communist. I do not believe in Marxist, and so on. It ought to be said. Because otherwise, you will speak with the serpent. So, this. The bishop uh, Pietraszko never touched the politicians, uh, po po politics problems, politi politician problems in his homilies. But for example, in the 80s, when there was the state of emergence, you know, uh, General Jaruzelski, he started his spiritual exercises with this gospel of Herod and said afterwards, now, my dear, we ought to leave Herod in his house, in his palace. We ought to go in the desert. Desert. We ought to pray and to convert ourselves. Herod should be alone. Every, everyone in the church, immediately, cut the content of this uh, word, but it was not politics, not. Thanks to the, to the, to it, <coughs> such homilies had a greater effect politi poli in politics, in the social life, than the homilies of priest, politician priest. Greater effect, because it was metaphysical effect. So it's quite different thing, and he could not be uh, he could not be arrested for such homilies. That was a problem for them. You know, that was a problem. Thank you very much, Professor Lilian.